All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about JINF, which is a new package for uh, PDE constraint optimization. It's been a pretty long uh, endeavor. We started with Julia point two, and I'm very happy to uh, show you some really good results um, about what we have. Um, we, can su we support many different applications in that package, mostly in PDE constraint optimization, PDE parameter estimation. And I, because I only have eight minutes or so, I will only talk about one application to show you roughly what we can do. So say you want to estimate the conductivity of the subsurface. Okay? So how do you do that without digging a hole? Um, one, way, one thing you can do is you can uh, do electric measurements. So you can uh, introduce some electric current and um, simulate or like measure the magnetic field on the surface, okay? And if you put this, this, the source in different locations, you would get different fields. And the field is on it also going to depend be dependent on the conductivity in the ground. Uh, what's behind this is um, the following uh, PDE. So you have the um, Laplace equation, uh, and this is the guy that you want to invert for, okay? That's the conductivity. Can be a tensor, can be a scalar. Um, and there are some boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the, the PDE we are going to deal with. Um, in the next slide, it's already gone um, because I will derive an optimization problem. So how, how do you do that in practice? I mean, you would kind of have a guess for your conductivity. You would simulate everything, compare it to your data, and then update your guess. So we do that in an optimization framework. There it is. Um, we take a look at the so-called reduced optimization problem. So we eliminate the PDE. So AIJK. That's the discretized PDE for a given model. And you see this inverse here, because that's applied to the source. And there are some measurements being taken from that. OK, so in the objective function, we have the PDE. Each call of the objective function, we need to solve the PDE. Um, I have the sub-index IJK in here. So what does that mean? So we have uh, receivers, sources, frequencies. That's three indices. We have tons of data. And we allow ourselves to use different meshes for each different combination, okay, to account for, um, to make the problem basically smaller. So we have not only one PDE to solve, but we have a ton of PDEs to solve. And here's the sum of all the PDEs. So when you look at this problem, you would think, or you would see that this is embarrassingly parallel. I mean, all terms here in this sum, I can basically uh, do in parallel. And Julia allows us to do that. Um, it's not so embarrassingly parallel, because at some point in your optimization, you also want to take derivatives. And we also like to use um, Hessian-based methods. So we want to do matrix vector products with the Hessian. And each of those guys is going to have a product with the inverse of the Hessian in them, uh, of the PDE in them. Okay? So you need to do some bookkeeping, because you don't want to, so you cannot arbitrarily send out the PDE to different workers. There's a lot of data that comes with them meshes, sources, receivers, uh, preconditioners, factorizations. So once that is assigned, you want to keep that fixed. But Julia allows the control to do that. OK. And I mean, we have tons of options how to, how to compare the data and what to do with regularization. And we have bound constraints, too. So just to give you an estimate, so for a toy problem where you have like 256 sources, three frequencies or so, uh, an inversion usually costs you 180k PDE solves until you get a solution, a reasonable image, OK? Um, that's a toy problem. So for a real problem, there is a 10 to the 11 here, OK? So how to solve these problems? Of course, one way to go, I mean, there's model order reduction, there's stochastic optimization. And one way I'm going to emphasize now is parallel and distributed computing. Um, so how do we do that? So say we have uh, two workers and three problems. Um, the main process here, that's the guy we, we talk to all the time in Julia, it has all of the data at, at the, uh, initially, but then it sends all the data and all the problem descriptions to the worker. They are busy preparing the, those problems and returning remote references when they are done. In this case, worker one is done earlier than worker two, so he gets the third problem. Okay, so now you have this setup. The main process forgets about all everything; it just holds the remote refs. Uh, the workers keep everything that is memory intensive. Okay. From now on, that's going to be a fixed assignment. So what do we do if we want to compute the misfit? Then you have the current guess for your conductivities in here on the main worker. You send them left and right. Uh, each of them solves the forward problems using whatever method you assign. 
um, but it takes quite a long time. Again, worker one is finished earlier. So it returns the current misfit, which is a scalar, and the gradient, which is a vector, um, and returns remote references to the fields, so the simulations, because the, the, these also take up a lot of memory. We don't communicate them. Um, and then it solves the third problem and returns that. And see here, for instance, for the, for the third problem, we use the direct method. So we will generate a factorization. And we're going to keep that alive on this worker, because we will come back later to that worker to do a Hessian matrix vector product. And we want to use that. We don't want to factorize the system more, more often than necessary. Um, and yeah, so for, for doing that, we have a specialized code, basically starting out from the PMAP and then really modifying it to, to do all this bookkeeping for us. Um, OK? So this is how you, how you do that. Um, well, you can, so the diff sigma grad param basically defines one of those problems. So you can kind of break up your sources into two batches, get two of them, you stack them underneath, then we do some on the fly parallelization. This is going to be very communication intensive because we send stuff around. Or you put them into an array of remote references and then everything is pre allocated. And I mean, this is kind of the beauty of using Julia because now, like, if you have your own problem, you just define one of those params, stack them in a vector, and everything is going to be parallelized. Uh, so, how does it scale? So, this is a scaling here on a, oops, well, that, that's, that's gone. Um, on a shared memory machine um, using a nonlinear PDE. So it's the iconal PDE. And you see that up to like 24 workers, which is the number of, of cores here, we get some reasonable scaling, like 70% weak scaling efficiency. So that's pretty good, I'd say. Um, they all share the same cache. So at some point, you would expect the efficiency to go down. But that's a pretty good run, I think. Uh, to convince ourselves this, that Julia really is a good way to go, we did one experiment on the AWS with 50 workers. And here we used the problem that I introduced, the Div Sigma Grad problem. And we used all solvers that we currently recommend using for that problem. So we compared MUMS, a block version of CG, a usual PCG. Um, and um, you can see that this scales really, really nicely up to like 50 workers or so. Um, something more we can do um, in JN, we can combine different physics. So that's something that's very relevant in practice, but rarely done because it's so complicated because people have a good solver for this problem, but not a good solver for the other problem. Now we have everything under one hood. So what you can do is you can have, um, you can combine two different types of physics. How do you do that? You open up a vector of problems and you stack different problems together and everything will work if you hold your fingers. Um, and so just to show you on one example that this is worth it. So here you see um, the true model on the top left. You see a reconstruction from the um, DC resistivity uh, survey. So that's uh, basically the Poisson equation. And on the bottom left, you see the travel time tomography. That's another modality sometimes collected <coughs> at the same time. And those images both like show you roughly where this, so you want to find this red thing. In this, in this case, it's a salt reservoir. Um, they show roughly the location, but they don't show the, a very nice image. And they both have different characteristics. So in the travel time tomography, you don't see the depth. If you combine them, you kind of see a much better picture. OK, so let me conclude then. So we have JINF. It's very flexible has different meshing, different problems, different applications. It's a ton of work that flow, flew into like the linear solvers and um, the parallelization, but it's pretty nice to use. We have a preprint of our paper online here, and I wish to thank everybody. <laughs>